everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today talking about nitrogen application with Dr. Brian Arnell, our Precision Nutrient Management Specialist. And, and Brian, let's kind of start with an overview of what's been going on for producers the last couple of weeks. Yeah, we've had uh, decent growth the last couple of weeks. The wheat's really starting to kind of green up and move. It's time where people are top dressing and think about top dressing. Uh, as you see right now, we had a great rain coming in and there's a lot of producers in the northwest and central part of the state that were able to get their nitrogen on ahead of the rain. But as we move across the, you know, a lot of our state, we're still too wet to get out there. And, and I'm feeling that the producers are thinking they're starting to get under a time crunch and worrying about getting nitrogen on. One of the things we got to keep in mind is that we're okay on time. Uh, a lot of our research uh, of recent looking at how late and when do we apply nitrogen says we still have plenty of time, even though we're getting closer to that hollow stem. So as we're down in the southern part of the state where it's just been too wet to get on, or as we look in the north part of the state where it rained now and we have wet soils, my recommendation is don't rush the application. Don't get out there and rut the field. We have time to make a good application on drier soil uh, and not mess up the field. Wheat uses nitrogen most efficient near that hollow stem. So as long as we get it on around hollow stem, even if we've been deficient for a little bit, our wheat crop will catch up. Let's talk about then as we're waiting for this kind of the fields to dry out, the planning part of it and making some of those decisions and maybe being a little more strategic and a little more efficient. What kind of guidance do you have for folks? So right now, a lot of the questions I'm getting are going back to source. We have some prices that are kind of shrinking and the difference between anhydrous, urea, and UAN right now is really starting to shrink in and get a little bit tighter, meaning they're closer and usually there's a wider gap. And so I really start looking at some, the cost of the fertilizer versus the efficiency of it and the efficiency of application. Uh, anhydrous is typically a cheaper source and those that have the capability to go in season as a top dresser, even the pre-plant right now can do that, but the applicator cost is more expensive. So when the other fertilizers start getting cheaper, you start thinking about, okay, I can get the same amount of nitrogen for just a little bit more and my application cost is less. Should I go ahead with that? In many cases, the answer is yeah, you could do a urea or UAN with the application. On the urea side, we have to be careful. If our soils are still wet, so if the mesonet says the fractional soil index is above a 0.7, if we don't get rain within seven days, our probability of losing urea uh, nitrogen through losses is a lot higher. Our most recent research shows that even when our average daily temperatures are just above freezing, the soil temps right about 40, if we put urea on a wet soil and it doesn't rain for seven days, we can lose as much as 10, 15 bushel of wheat. So, you know, hold that back. That's when we want to switch into a liquid UAN streamed on. Now we have a couple options with UAN. It can be streamed on, which means that you aren't doing the flat fan like we would do a herbicide and it's broadcasting little particles, but it's streaming on a thicker stream of UAN. That's really good in weather like right now where we can get that UAN concentrated on, on the soil or on the residue and wash down. Obviously a lot to think about with wheat, but not too early to kind of get your mind on summer crops as well. Absolutely not. As the soil temps are warming up, we're getting those planters prepped and starting to roll for the corn planting and sorghum and soybean and elsewhere. So we need to make sure we have our proper nutrients in place to get those summer crops going. If you don't have a soil sample done, it's not too late to get a soil sample collected once it dries out. Make sure you go to zero to six inches if you're sending it into OSU Soils Testing Lab or to whatever your lab that you send it to recommends, whether it's zero to six, zero to seven inch depth. Look at those PNK values, look at your pH. We can't do anything about soil pH this time, really, because it takes too long for the soil to react with the lime to get that pH to change. But making sure we have proper phosphorus, potassium, and all of our other nutrients in place to get that summer crop up and going to get the best roots established and get that early season vigor going to make it through our summer is extremely important right now. Okay, thanks a lot, Brian. A lot to think about. We'll see you again soon. While the weather conditions in most of Oklahoma have been pretty hectic when it comes to rain and the fluctuating temperatures, Bob, when it comes to disease in most of our crops, it's been pretty mild. Yes, it has. Uh, even starting from last fall, there was an effective late planting date for the wheat. It was very small in the fall. 
We never got any fall foliar diseases developing, and in fact, in our uh, diagnostic lab, of the half a dozen or so samples we've got in, none of them have been positive for any disease or pathogen. Um, well, going forward into this, the winter months, we've had you know a lot of uh, a lot of precipitation in, in a lot of part of the state. Is it surprising that nothing's developed with that amount of rainfall? It is to some extent because moisture usually favors a lot of the foliar diseases, and uh, there just hasn't hasn't been any. And I think a lot of it is because of that late planting date in the fall and the wheat being small. It just hasn't developed into diseases, at least to this point in time. In, in regards to like the temperature fluctuation, does that have anything to do with it at all either? Yeah, the temperature, uh, it, I mean the winter temperatures are typically too cold for diseases to really get going and that's why we look for them uh, because if we find some disease then, then all it's waiting for is that little bit warmer temperature and as you said we definitely have had the moisture. But uh, one of the things I've watched for is uh, what's going on down in Texas. And uh, Dr. Amir Ibrahim, who's the geneticist and breeder down at College Station, uh, sent me a, a text today that uh, said that they've not seen any uh, stripe rust or leaf rust down in South Texas to this point in time. And if they're not seeing stripe rust down there by now, chances are we're not gonna have much of it up here in Oklahoma. And that, that's usually how that process works. It starts down there and then the, the inoculum period just moves up, right? Right, the winds, the southerly winds tend to blow that inoculum up here to Oklahoma and there's not much inoculum down there to be picked up at this point in time. now. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim did not think that stripe rust would be a problem down there, but leaf rust could still come on as the temperatures warm even more down there. What type of, uh, in, in regards to timing when producers would start seeing uh, leaf rust, what, when should they start being, not really concerned, but just keeping an eye out? Well, even starting now, not so much for the rust because there's not been any reports of it from Texas, but some of the leaf spotting diseases, uh, such as tan spot and Staginospora septoria, some of those, in fact, um, Josh Anderson, who's a senior associate researcher, uh, research associate down at the Noble Research Institute, he sent pictures to me this week of tan spot and some plots that he has down there. And this is right on the Red River, so it's real close to Texas. All right, thanks, Bob. Bob Hunger, Extension Small Grains Pathologist here at Oklahoma State University. Welcome to the weekly Mesonet Weather Report. I'm Wes Lee. Well, it was another wet one for Oklahoma. Most of the state received additional moisture in either the wet or frozen variety. Seven-day rainfall from Wednesday morning shows amounts from nearly three inches in the southeast to less than a tenth of an inch in the far northwest. Soil moisture is just about as wet as it can get as well. At the two inch level, the ones on the fractional water index represent the wettest side of the scale. The point nines are just slightly behind. Only the far northwest counties are showing numbers in the light green colors. At our deepest sensors in the soil, located at 24 inches, we see the eastern two thirds of the state maxing out the scale with all the ones. However, this map shows the remaining two areas in the state that might benefit from additional rainfall. This would be the southwest and the panhandle. These two regions have numbers that reach the driest end of the scale at zero. While the shallow soils there are in pretty good shape, rains have not been heavy enough lately to percolate to these deeper depths. The forecast for the week ahead does not indicate that we will see much drying out. Normal to slightly wetter than normal conditions are expected. Now here's Gary with a longer look at the rainfall situation. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well another really good week of moisture across the state as Wes was mentioning. A little bit of rain and snow across western Oklahoma. A lot of rain across eastern Oklahoma. How's that impact the latest drought monitor? Let's take a look. Now I swear we're just one decent rain away from completely getting rid of drought across southwest Oklahoma. You can see that area, just a small kidney bean shape down there across the far southwest, a moderate drought. It's really on its way out. If we can just get one more good bout of moisture, I think we could uh, get that uh, down to at least the yellow, the abnormally dry conditions, which signals drought on its way out. 
Now across the western panhandle, they've had some decent moisture as well, but not quite enough, and especially as we go back to the longer time frames uh, to get rid of that moderate and uh, severe drought that plagues uh, much of Cimarron and a little bit of Texas County. Now the rest of the state, we're looking really good. So let's talk about that long-term rain and its deficits and surpluses. Um, we'll go back to the water year, the beginning of the water year, October 1st, 2019. We can see less than two inches in that region in the far western panhandle, less than four to five inches down there in the far southwest and parts of west central Oklahoma. Then we go all the way up to close to 30 inches uh, across eastern Oklahoma. So a vast disparity in moisture across the state. You know, what else is new for the state of Oklahoma? Uh, but when we look at the uh, departure from normal for that same time frame, October 1st through the present, then we start to see the deficits. Uh, deficits in the southwestern parts of the state uh, from one to close to three inches. If we go to the percent of normal rainfall map and take a look out there in the far western panhandle, uh, that's uh, close to 50 to 60 percent of normal uh, for much of Cimarron County, uh, extending up uh, close to Texas County. So that's why we have that moderate to severe drought persisting out in that region of the state. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. The December trade data is in and that completes 2019. So Darrell, what's the situation for beef exports? Well, 2019 uh, beef exports were down a little bit, uh, about 4.4% on a year-over-year -year basis. We were actually down to four of our five biggest markets, so we were down to Japan, uh, Mexico, Canada, and Hong Kong in particular was off sharply. Uh, we were still up on a year-over-year -year basis to South Korea, which is now our number two market. So what about beef imports? On the import side, we were actually up a little bit, about 2%. Uh, we had been basically flat for three years prior to that, so it really wasn't a big increase. Uh, again, up a little bit from uh, most of our major sources, so uh, Australia, uh, Canada, uh, Mexico, uh, but we were off sharply from New Zealand last year. So looking ahead for 2020 in regards to trade, what do you expect and how does the, the coronavirus factor into all that? Well, the coronavirus recently has, has really you know, thrown a big wrinkle in a lot of these markets and, and still leaves us with a lot of uncertainty at this point. Um, you know, we just don't know yet how big a deal this is going to be. If it turns into a, a you know, really major global health event, then uh, this could be a serious disruption to markets on a longer term basis. Um, you know, hopefully we're going to get a handle on it here in the next uh, two to four weeks and, and uh, you know, start to see those impacts go away. Beyond that, um, you know, beef, uh, our expectations are for both uh, beef exports to be up a little bit and beef imports will likely be down a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, potential to re, uh, recoup a little bit of the lost ground we have in Japan. Uh, there's lots of potential in China right now. And then on the import side, we know Australia is not going to export as much. Uh, many of the other countries are exporting more to China as well. Yeah, you mentioning, you know, speaking of China, so how, what's the situation going on with China right now? You know, on a beef market side, China has really changed the, the situation for global beef markets. Uh, beef demand in China has grown tremendously in the last uh, four, five, six years, uh, so much so that in the last couple of years, China uh, is now the by far the biggest beef importing country in the world. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, a number of major exporting countries are redirecting a lot of their beef into the China market. Now the U.S. hasn't participated in that a great deal, although our exports to China were up a little bit uh, in the last half of 2019, but for the year we were only up about one, or they only represented about 1.1% of our total exports. So we hope to see a lot more potential going forward. We've got a little better access now with the phase one trade deal. Uh, and so uh, hopefully we'll see that grow in, in the coming weeks and months and, and years. All right, thanks, Daryl. Dr. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Even though we're still in the throes of the spring calving season, it's not too early to begin thinking about uh, the breeding season that's go going to be coming up here maybe in the middle of April on into May and June, especially for those producers that are going to use artificial insemination because 
quite frankly, we have to plan in advance of a, any AI breeding program, especially the estrus synchronization that we're going to use. Estrus synchronization is uh, the situation, of course, where we're going to use um, one or more different kinds of products, working cattle through the chute uh, one or more times before we actually do artificial insemination. Choosing which ester synchronization protocol we're going to use on our place is really something that takes some uh, real investigation and some serious thought. A way to get some help about which ester synchronization protocol you want to use is by going online and looking up uh, the uh, ester synchronization protocols that have been proposed by what's called the Applied Reproduction Tra Task Force. That's a group of scientists from seven different universities around the country that all work on, in this area of cattle reproduction. And they have put together a list of this ester synchronization protocols that, think, that they think work best in different situations. For instance, if you're more interested in being able to do a heat detection on your cows or heifers for a long period of time, say up to two weeks, then a simple synchronization protocol might work for you. If you're only willing to do heat detection for a few days, then another system may work best. And if you're one of those that just doesn't want to do heat detection at all, but wants to use timed AI, where everything is brought in on a given morning and everything is artificially inseminated that time, then of course you'll use a different system. Also, they categorize the different uh, ester synchronization protocols for replacement heifers, yearling replacement heifers, versus those that work best for mature cows that have calves nursing on them at the time of the AI breeding. And so you'll want to keep that in mind as well. Also, if you happen to have brahma influence cattle, they have a separate uh, ester synchronization system that research has shown has worked the best for that particular breed set. So I think if you'll go online and look up the uh, Applied Reproduction Task Force, we've put a show link uh, on the SunUp website just so that you can go and look up those uh, protocols that best fits your operation. And you'll also see some other fact sheets and some planning tools on uh, that website that'll be really helpful to you if you're going to do AI this year. So I really recommend that you plan ahead, go to the SUNUP website, that's sunup.okstate.edu, look under show links, and go to that link and study your lesson before you do your artificial insemination this year. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow Calf Corner. Salmonella infections in humans are not uncommon, and most of these infections are associated with some type of contaminated food that we eat. But sometimes animal contact can be the source of the infection. An unusual fact that the CDC has found that children tend to be more associated with animal contact than with food when it comes to salmonella infections, uh, especially young children. In 2019, we had over 1,000 people that were infected with salmonella that were associated with backyard poultry. And about 287 of those people were hospitalized and we had two of those individuals die from those infections. In these populations, children are overrepresented. In a study that looked at the years 1990 to 2014, about 31% of the cases were children five years of age or less and about 42% of those cases were in children 10 years of age or less. So children are overrepresented in this population. And the experts tell us that the reason for this is probably, one, their immune systems are not fully mature, and two, they have poor hand hygiene practices. Another reason that we might see is just the lack of knowledge that these animals can infect them. In a study that looked at people who had been infected with salmonella that were associated with backyard poultry, uh, most of these people had some very close contact with their animals. They snuggled them, they kissed them, they kept them in their house. Practices that are probably uh, conducive for getting infection. The other thing people may not realize, 
animals are healthy and look healthy, that doesn't necessarily mean that they cannot pass pathogens in their feces or other bodily fluids. The most important thing we need to remember is that when children have contact with animals, they need to make sure and wash their hands afterwards. The CDC tells us that, we, that you should uh, wet your hands, put soap on, lather up, and rub those hands vigorously for about 20 seconds. I don't want to discourage anyone from having chickens in their backyards. It's a great hobby. Uh, it's a way that people that live in some of the in town or the cities can have animals and can uh, learn more about where their food comes from. But it's really important that we protect ourselves and make sure that we practice good hand hygiene after touching any animal. If you like some more information about uh, salmonella infections and that are associated with backyard poultry, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, let's start with an overview this week of what's been going on in the wheat markets. Well, since the end of January, not much. Uh, you got the Oklahoma price around $4.45, It's a plus or minus four cent on price move. Now, the, the last half of January, we took about oh, 20 uh, in the last week and an overall around 45 cents off those prices. Let's talk about why exactly prices dropped. Well, the world's got too much wheat. Essentially, the 2019-20 uh, wheat harvest is complete with finishing up in South America. Uh, but uh, why we've had lower prices is we just got an excess amount of wheat. Uh, you look at a record world crop at 28.1 billion bushels. The world stocks to use ratio at 38.2 percent. Uh, the U.S. stocks to use ratio at uh, around 44 percent. Now, if you look at the back Black Sea area, uh, those countries, the stocks use, use ratio is around 9%, so we have lower prices because we get a lot more wheat. Let's talk about Oklahoma and how we compare to the rest of the world. Well, this last week, uh, Russia sold uh, wheat into Egypt for uh, $239.43 a metric ton. That's about six fifty two dollars a bushel. If you go from Houston to e Egypt, that ocean freight's around, oh, 70, 72 cents. It is lower than it was about a month ago. Uh, Houston, about 20 cents in and out of that elevator, $1.20 to get it back to Oklahoma. Gets the Oklahoma price right at $4.40. That means we're competitive in that North African uh, market, and we're really competitive in uh, the Pacific Islands there and, and uh, Eastern Asia. Any hope for higher prices? That's on everybody's mind. Well, I, I don't think uh, uh, right now we know how much uh, wheat we got in the bin from last year's crop. Uh, the market's watching the crop conditions for the uh, 2020 crop. Right now, everything looks relatively good around the world except for Australia, but they'll be planting relatively soon, and I understand they are getting some rains there. So I don't think there's any hope in it. You know, we may get a little rally out of it, but not over the next couple of months. Uh, we're going to have to lose a crop somewhere to get higher prices. What about protein then? Well, if you look at the, uh, the, the protein basis in Kansas City for uh, ordinary wheat, that's less than 11. It's 80 cents. 11 percent to 11 eighths, anywhere from 90 to a dollar and five cents. 12 percent to a dollar 30, or uh, if you get 12, six percent, a dollar 50. So you got around a seven, 70 percent premium if you can get 12, six wheat. With all this in mind, your guidance for wheat producers? Well, I heard a, a, a big buyer of uh, wheat, of a, a flour miller and baker this last week, and he said what they're concerned about is protein. I think uh, produce, they want test weight, 60 pound plus, and they want 12.4 12, 12 protein or better. Deliver that, you're gonna get a relatively good price. Okay, great talking with you. We'll see you next week, Kim. What ingredient was described as especially dear to the gods by the philosopher Plato and a divine substance by the poet Homer? The answer is salt. Food grade salt is defined by the Food and Chemical Codex based on its purity, which may range from 99.8 to 99.95% based on its source and how it's processed. Table salt is comprised mostly of sodium chloride, but may contain small amounts of other chemical compounds such as calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, and potassium chloride. Verifying the purity of salt is important 
because the associated compounds and trace metals can cause problems in certain food applications. For example, calcium and magnesium can interfere with the emulsion in margarine. They can also cause off flavors and colors in mayonnaise. Salt used in commercial applications may contain food additives not necessarily found in your typical table salt, such as anti-caking agent that prevents salt crystals from caking or clumping together. In addition to flavoring food, salt can also be effective in controlling microbial growth. Foods like pickles and processed meat use salt as a preservative where it inhibits the growth of disease-causing and or spoilage microorganisms. Other foods, such as cheese, use salt to control the amount of acid produced by lactic acid bacteria during fermentation to help control the product's final flavor. So whether it's deer, divine, or of concern, salt plays a large role in the food that we eat. For more information, please visit sunup.okstate.edu or fapc.biz. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.